Hey, welcome back. This is Cerebral Valley. I'm Eric Newcomer. My guests on this episode will be Amy Wu of Menlo Ventures, who was an investor at FTX and deep in the crypto world and is now hardcore into AI gaming investments. And Keith Kawahata, who's the CEO of a stealth AI gaming startup and has mm. been a mobile gaming exec at a bunch of different companies. We, we, so we'll, we need we'll to talk to him. 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 I need yeah. to hear more about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have Max Child and James Wilsterman, my Cerebral Valley co-hosts and Volley co-founders here. This episode is very much in their domain. We're going to talk about artificial intelligence and its impact on entertainment and some of the time, particularly their field, gaming. Welcome back. Happy to be here. Explain Volley and the uh, how sort of the AI games world as you guys experience it. Sure. Well, we're definitely in a very specific corner of AI games, and we're built around voice control. So we build games that you talk to rather than play with a controller or you know use on a touch screen like your smartphone. So we have games that you can play on. You know, an AI device like an Amazon Alexa, as well That's as- That's where on, the majority of them are, right? That is where the majority of our users are today. But actually the fastest growing part of our company is on smart TVs, Roku and Fire TV. And we have different types of games you can play with your voice. We have game shows like Jeopardy. So we have like Jeopardy on Roku and you get a big board in front of you like you're actually on Jeopardy and you can buzz in with your remote and, you know, say, give me US Capitals for 200, Alex. And, you know, what is Sacramento? And yeah. We have a number of other kind of voice control gaming experiences, including storytelling, kind of fiction, choose your own adventure that you control with your voice, as well as some music stuff. Like name that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is that still, are people still into that or is it? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's actually pretty popular. That's our choose your own adventure fiction game. To, you, to get they give you like two options yeah. and you go one way or the other. It's been out for six years. It's still going, but it's not, I would say, uh, one of flagships. It's not the cutting edge of all. Yeah. should stop talking but, about that. But no, but I think it's an interesting tie to where we are today with AI because the reason we built YesSire at the time was to really simplify what you could say to the device, really dumb it down a lot so that it never misunderstood you or you know couldn't process your language input. So it was two choices. You could either say yes or no, and that would affect the game. I think where we are today with AI, I think it's much, you know, the technology has improved drastically where it, you know, it recognizes things better, but also now with LLMs, we can take in a lot wider sort of inputs around natural language. So, you know, obviously part of the volley bet is, which yeah. has a huge AI component because there's sort of the voice recognition mm -hmm. and all that. And we could probably do a whole episode on, and you guys are obviously big advocates of voice being sort of one of the main ways we'll talk to AIs. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, like, when you think of gaming and AI generally, I mean, I think of, like, creation, or what are the pieces where you actually think artificial intelligence and generative AI, I mean, assets, you know, like, yeah, what are the yeah. parts of games that you see yeah. AI fitting into? I think there's a lot of different layers of the stack, as we would call it, right? And I think that, you know, our company's built on some stuff that really started working five or six years ago in the sort of last generation of, you know, deep learning, machine learning, AI, whatever you want to call it at the time. And that was just speech recognition getting pretty good all of a sudden. And, you know, Alexa being one of the big steps forward there. And then secondly, like what we call like natural language processing, which is like turning human phrasing into meaning, right? And both of those got pretty good, like seven, eight, 10 years ago, however you want to measure it. And that was sort of what enabled our company to exist was like, you could build a game on an Alexa device, and when you said, you know, something to a, a storytelling game, yes, sir, it would understand it, and we could do the right thing, right? But to your point, what's exciting about you know the last year and a half, and the reason we have a Cerebral Valley conference is the sort of the generative element of AI has really taken this hugely forward. The idea that we can create new things that that you know AI can create things that humans either couldn't create as quickly or they can do remixes that have never been done before. And there's a few different things that AI can generate. One is just text, right? It can generate scripts for a storytelling game or a movie, right? It can generate images, like you were talking about assets within a game. So like art that you could use within a game, you could have an AI generate it like a stable diffusion or a mid journey. And then one thing that's relevant for us is also it can generate fake voices, right? It can create synthesized voices very mm. easily. You know, 10 does years Alexa, ago. Does Amazon yeah. let you do that right now? Yeah, so Alexa was one of the first, you know, high quality synthesized voices, but 10 years ago it cost like 
a quarter million dollars to make a good synthesized voice. And then today, with the sort of generative transformer wave, it costs like five bucks now. So it's come down by a fact. I think oh, with Descript, yeah. we're going to, you know, you know, if I'm too busy, they're going to slice in. Yeah, uh, producer right. Scott's going to fill in my voice yeah. as needed. So. Yeah, so Who that's knows come... what I actually said on this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You know, some people call it like deep fake voices or I, you know, I think right. just like synthesized voices is kind of an amazing. I mean, it's literally like 100,000 times better than it was 10 years ago, which is right. like really big. Um, yeah. One so, of our most recent games on Roku where you can play Jeopardy, it's actually hosted by one of our employees. We synthesize his voice and it sounds amazing. It sounds really realistic but we were able to do that because of the advancement in the technology. Hmm. Right. And so in, in all kinds of gaming, whether or not you believe voice is the input or controllers are the input or it's mobile gaming or whatever, I think the output stuff, the content of the game, the art and the assets and the voices and the way you hear the experience and the music as well, we haven't talked about as well. Like you could synthesize music in games. Those are all like completely going to change or changing as we speak across the whole world of gaming from like, triple a you know crazy console games all the way down to like more casual experiences and, and more sort of family game night type stuff which is a lot of what we build james which one do you think will be the actual most revolutionary or you know there's a lot there but which piece of it are you most excited about so max and i really like this scene in her which people probably don't remember very well but it is a scene in her where um the main character is playing a video game. Um, and it's really interesting because the character in the game is like a foul mouthed alien sort of child. And the player has to kind of interact with it with natural language and convince it to help him on a quest. Um, but you know, it gets, the character is not <clears throat> really helpful. It's like very ad adversarial. And I think that opens up some new, kind of ideas in gaming and in AI. Right now, every assistant is trying to be extremely helpful, whereas once you kind of put this in an entertainment context, right. you can have adversarial AI that are, you know, leading you astray. What, what do you think feels close? Like, I, you know, we see, I haven't played them, but you know, you hear about like the No Man's Sky, like there are all these space games. I don't know if they're not using LLMs necessarily, but they're trying to generate sort of automatic Procedural generation, you know, yeah. Right. There's a lot like, let's throw technology at this stuff. And, you know, human storytelling is still, you know, the best thing out there. And that a lot of this yeah. stuff can end up feeling gimmicky. What do you, what, what yeah. feels close that, I mean, that would actually be useful? I, I think there's, I think there's three layers of like complexity of the content generation you can do in gaming and in sort of entertainment more broadly. I think the first layer is you can just generate some content, let's say it's, you know, a script in a game or in a movie, or in our case, like a trivia question, let's say, right? Um, and you can generate it from an LLM. You can ask an LLM for a Jeopardy question right now. You'll get something pretty good. You know, we would look it over and have a human in the loop doing some editing, but then we'd, we'd put it into one of our trivia games, right? And so that would be like, hey, the humans who work for Volley or whatever game company now have to you do a lot. just get a little better. Yeah. yeah, they just got a little better, right? They're, be they're faster writers, or let's say they're an artist, right? And they can generate artwork way faster or generate a bunch of ideas really quickly and then discard some of them and iterate on some of them. But in the end, there's a review process and then these things ship into the games, right? Um, that, I think, is like happening as we speak, right? I mean, within our company, like that's happening as we speak. Within other gaming companies, I'm aware of people already doing generative art for in this kind of pipeline where they use a mid-journey or stable diffusion or whatever or some specialized tool and then they review it and then they ship it out to to their players right so that's like level one and that's happening like for sure but it is basically like augmenting the human in the loop basically then there's like the second layer which we talked a little bit on the first episode about but it's like you start personalizing the content within a gaming experience in real time or you were talking about a TikTok feed being personalized for each person, but a gaming context is often easier to sort of think about where it's, okay, let's use the Jeopardy example again. Let's say that every question within the Jeopardy game that I'm playing is is literally decided for me by a right. large Eric's language a model. Idiot. Yeah. And he, he needs to win <laughs> right. enough right. for him to keep right. playing. So well, let's but not just difficulty adjustments though, but what if you were able to say, you know, if you're really like obsessed with Harry Potter, you could just make the whole board mm -hmm. about Harry Potter and it would generate instantly, right? Yeah. Or if you're studying for, 
you know, an AP physics class, like why not tur- put that into our game yeah. and play a Jeopardy board of AP physics questions, right. right? I think those will be shipping out more and more in the next three, six, 12 months where you're creating personalized experiences and or you're enabling user-generated kind of content experiences in games. And then the last level was sort of what James was talking about where AI are characters in games, right? Let's just say you're playing Zelda and you run into some dwarf or whatever and like, it just like talks to you, right? And you're talking to the dwarf and like you, ha- it has some mission in mind, which is to give you a potion or whatever. And, but you can ask it like anything. You can be like, hey, like, where should I go next? Like, why is my sword like, you know, wearing down? Like how many, you know, coins is it gonna cost me to upgrade my shield or whatever, right? You can ask it questions, but in the end, there's some object of that conversation, right? And I think non-player characters like that generated by large language models is, you know, it's really expensive is honestly the biggest thing holding it back right now. If you want to run a really good large language model, like a GPT at, at that kind of scale, having millions of gamers playing it, it's like really expensive. But I think that in a couple of years or a year or two or whatever, there'll be ways to sort of minify these models or focus these models or just the hardware will get cheaper or whatever. And then you'll start to see the stuff in World of Warcraft or Zelda or whatever, you know. And and just to zoom out, like, why are we talking about gaming besides, obviously, you guys being experts? <laughs> I do, I, I mean, gaming in so much of technology is sort of the bleeding edge of what consumers mm-hmm. experience. Like, obviously, in AI right now, there's a ton of infrastructure wonky stuff that the regular person's never going to see. But I do think gaming and entertainment will be where a lot of this stuff emerges. You know, we, we've talked about before, you know, sort of the chat apps, which are sort of, Gaming. Interactive entertainment. Yeah, right. right. Well, I mean, NVIDIA, which is the biggest company in AI right now, literally spent decades selling GPUs to gaming companies, right? I mean, right. NVIDIA exists because of gaming, right? I mean, to your right. point, gaming is always, it's, you know, it's the bleeding edge of entertainment because it, it is fundamentally just like interactive entertainment. And, you know, when you add technology to entertainment, you get gaming basically, right? So I think that, yeah, I, I and I also just think that if you look at industry dynamics, gaming now makes more money than movies and TV and music like all put together. It's, it is the biggest entertainment industry in the world by a huge margin. So it is like fundamentally how people actually really experience entertainment these days. I wanted to pull, be the journalist and annoy my sure. friends. <laughs> Would you use Ad Volley mid journey or Dolly mm. assets? Or what, <laughs> yeah, what are your lawyers telling you in terms of like actually putting these things in a game because some of this is going to be like which big company you're not as big but which big company is going to take the risk on this sort of thing Mm. right yeah i think that's a really interesting question (laughs) and i honestly i think we are discussing this a lot internally to give a real answer it's it is a topic of debate inside our company to say the least and i think that you know i think the maybe we'll get to the whole copyright discussion later in in the soon yeah the podcast but i think that the question of whether or not training a huge image AI on a bunch of like images you scraped off websites is legal or not is like an open question. (laughs) And so I think we would try to use something where we had some good information about the provenance of the training data. And I don't know, James, you've obviously been thinking about this even more than I have. Uh, Yeah. What do do you think? Yeah. I think that right now the answer is no, we don't use uh, AI generated images in our products. And I think we are internally debating that and trying to understand where this image data came from and how do we feel about the legal implications of that. I think that there's, so Dolly 3 was announced recently. I think they specifically mentioned there would be like robust opt-out features for artists and their training data. And I think that we'll start to see more and more of, you know, like Max said, tools that actually have to delineate the provenance of the data. And then maybe that opens up, you know, a legal path for it, but it's really an open question. Did you guys see that Getty Images just launched uh, a a image generation tool? Yeah, so that's pretty exciting. I think the progress in 100% licensed image generation is very fast, right? And so I think if you are concerned about that side of things, I think that you now have Adobe Firefly, which is all licensed. You have the Getty generation tool, which is all licensed. So I guess I just sort of think this isn't going to be that much of a problem even in a year from now because you're going to have pretty robust you know licensed generative tools i do think like an interesting sub subsequent question here though is these are be these types of questions are being litigated in the courts right i mean there are a bunch of lawsuits occurring right um, sarah silverman and people sarah silverman other artists and 
I don't know. What do you guys think? Do we think that there's a clear outcome of that based on current law or do you think they're you know mm-hmm. that these it seems models... very serious like it, I, I do think there's got to be some copyright i mean not being a lawyer but just mm. you know do you, do you think know. that applies to llms too then i mean that's essentially what sarah Silver, silverman is saying right, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah i hope i, I mean, mean would I you have an think... issue if i could create a newcomer article based on scraping all the newcomer articles i mean you're a yeah. journalist so a lot of your original content is from reporting <laughs> not from your writing but yeah i mean Definitely. Yeah. So you, you do have it. You, you have, I mean, that's part of, I mean, so yeah, 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 this is exactly the writer's strike. We want to talk about it. Let's talk about it because it's directly relevant to this question. I think, you know, even me sort of being very bullish on AI and like around it, you can sort of laugh a little bit at the writers making like prioritizing AI sort of like a top priority. It feels paranoia. On the other hand, all the things we've said in this conversation, it feels very current that you know they basically won protections that you know you know chat product products can't replace their work like the writers mm-hmm. get to choose if they use it and sort of a bunch of different and they got um, that basically and yeah that, exactly. was, that was the resolution right i mean um, do you think they needed it i, I don't know i guess the yeah was that I a real so. and present danger yeah, yeah. so I've, i have a good story on this front which is i was meeting a big like hollywood studio honcho like six months ago and he was like, oh, you know, what do you think about all this AI stuff? And I was like, oh, I think it's pretty cool. You know, you pray around with ChatGPT, whatever. And he's like, ah, oh, yeah, like, he's like, I asked it to come up with some, like, new movie ideas for our studio. And he's like, came out with seven ideas. And he's like, honestly, like, five of them were pretty good. <laughs> he was like, he, he was like, I think I might use, like, five of them, honestly. Oh. And Which this is, is like, a real Hollywood studio exec, guy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. I never know what so good ideas funny. have hit you in the face. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying I was in the room where the guy was right. like, oh, yeah, yeah. like these, are, these ideas were pretty good, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it didn't produce screenplays for him, for the right. record, but it had some concepts that were going to work for him. So Yeah, well, I think the agreement that was struck here, you know, a lot of it had to do with can you take, can these studios take these old scripts that they own, that the writers wrote, but, you know, gave away, away those copyrights essentially to the studios. Can they use them to train future scripts? And I think what is, you know, going kind of unsaid there is that, you know, everyone believes that in the current legal system, legal frameworks, like the studios have every right to go use those scripts for training and write future scripts with. However, you know, the unions were able to negotiate sort of like retroactive rights for their writers on scripts that they already sold to the To make a broad point on this that is eating up at me. I mean, first of all, (laughs) it seems right now like foundation models are becoming pretty commoditized. There are several of them. Like maybe OpenAI stays far enough ahead and finds other moats. But like in some ways, like the creative expression is more unique, right? Lord of the Rings is like more singular. And... Yeah, I just don't think like somebody should be able to just like, steal. Lord. That was a great creative work. And just because people didn't <laughs> foresee this technology being around at the time, like why should just like these technologists who found, who are the first ones to figure out how to steal the idea in a way they could get away with be the ones to <laughs> well, profit off of it? I don't know. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm I, on I don't the creative think, side here. I don't think that, you know, us at Volley could create a game based on Middle Earth. Right. And that's just because of existing IP protections that prevent us from doing that, whether or not we write the content with AI or not, right? And likewise, nobody is, can go and write a whole, you know, a bunch of newcomer articles and claim they're part of newcomer, right? Because you right. have, you own the IP. So the question is more like, can I, you know, write a brand new IP script that, you know, has some, training data of the original Lord right. of the Rings series. And, and and, it gets to the, what are the core idea is an LLM because yeah, obviously exactly. like right. a human being, you wouldn't say you can't go and read Lord of the Rings and then go right. write another book having like been changed. Right. It's like, of course, <laughs> that's basically what all art is. You know? Yeah. Right. But I mean, with that's... the machine, you're like, well, you basically just pull li- little bits and pieces from everything and that's right. stealing. Right. Right. So yeah, I mean, it, it, they're big, like philosophical, like how, you know, how different is it from how a human being sort of operates? Yeah. I fascinates. mean, yep. I think, you know, we, one thing we think about it, on copyright side, but also I think on the sort of like conceptual side of, you know, stealing versus remixing versus original content is 
like in the US, we actually have this pretty robust framework on copyright. We call it, you know, the, the fair use test of whether or not you can reuse some portion of copyrighted work, right? And when you can, it's called fair use. And when you can't, you're infringing and, and you can be sued or whatever, right? And there's a bunch of key elements of the fair use test that I actually think are all really interesting and relevant in the AI discussion and the LLM discussion. And the gen image and music generation is also really hot topics here. Like the key pieces are like, how transformative is the use of the original work? You know, is the new work compared to the original work? So how much have you changed basically? Like how different it is actually fairly important. How much of the original work you're using or replicating is also fairly important. Whether or not the use is commercial is also like a big part. Are you selling this thing for money or is it just like a fun project or is it educational? And then the last piece, which we've all kind of been talking about is, are you, impinging upon the market for the original work, mm. which is like really important, right? Really? So yeah, so to the Lord of the Rings discussion, like if I created a, you know, a fantasy novel that's set in a sort of, a, you know, vaguely related universe to the Lord of the Rings, but I didn't call it the Lord of the Rings and, you know, I wasn't stealing any of the characters and, you know, J.R. Tolkien's estate wasn't going to sell less Lord of the Rings books because I came out with a new fantasy novel, then that's a pretty good use, you know, example of like fair use where I'm not really impinging upon the original and it's also quite transformative, right? I think music is the one where this is like the most stark in some cases because there's these AI TikTokers that are making like fake Drake music, right? right. And like fake like Taylor Swift music and stuff, right? And the music industry obviously doesn't like this. They're having them, trying to have them all taken down, right? And it's an interesting question. If I make a fake Drake song, like, obviously that's not very transformative, right? <laughs> but am I impinging upon the market for Drake, right? Am I like, am I capturing some portion of Drake love in the universe, right. you know, with my fake Drake song? And I kind of think so. Yeah, I sort of agree. Like, right. I, I think that the fake Drake tracks are probably copyright violations, right? But... Then the second question is like, what if I make a completely new piece of music, right? That is trained on every pop music, ever, you know, piece of pop music ever, but doesn't sound like any existing artist right. in a meaningful way, right? I'm not pretending it's Taylor Swift. I'm not pretending it's Drake, whatever. Right. It just is a new band that, you know, it's the Max James and Eric band that puts out awesome pop music because it's a really cool AI creation based on existing pop music. Is that fair use if you train it on all the pop music? I'm sure this will be litigated quite heavily, but... I think you could make an argument that it's fair use. You know, well, there, it's there's also question, a question right? that AI is like, new and there should be new regulations. I, I'm very torn on what yeah. independent of law, what ought to be the case. On the one hand, it's it would be nice to have a system where artists got paid proportionally to how much their work, you know, sort of created the circumstances for the new AI based mm -hmm. invention. On the other hand, just you know, all those sort of barriers, you know, just create lots of hurdles to new ideas and you know it's like the same type of thinking that prevents like you know remixes and sampling and all that stuff when that's what the consumer ultimately wants and enjoys and also in the context of an llm or a transformer model like it seems pretty hard to tie this new output of the song like that yeah. yeah attribute it back to the thousand artists right who had some factor you know yeah, who yeah. deserve some yeah. fraction of a penny right I, I just think it's not practical Blockchain. so <laughs> 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 but, if, but if I make fake Van Gogh art on Mid Journey, should the Van Gogh estate get a cut of it? Any, feels like any, in some any, just any, world. Any, like, any, I mean, yeah, maybe. That's out of it's just an interesting though, right? You can do it. Yeah. I mean, so, but yeah, okay. it, it Van Gogh, if it's like Calvin yeah. and Hobbes, yeah, yeah right. definitely, you know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you call it Calvin and Hobbes, for sure. Right, sure. I, but I think this is just, like, we don't even need to know whether it was A or I or not. We already have these laws in place. If I, a court looks at it and it looks like Calvin and Hobbes, or it is called yeah, Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, right? you're already in trouble. Like, right. why does it matter yeah. if it was generated by AI? Yeah. So that's kind of why I push back against the idea that we do need new laws, because I've never heard a better framework than this one, I guess. I'm not saying they don't exist, but at least yeah. this one covers like a lot of the relevant considerations here, right? And the big one being, are you impacting the original art, you know, the value of the original work in a negative way, right? I think that's super important. And it's hard to figure out even in an AI world, unless you go whole hog and you're just like, yeah, scraping any copyrighted content is illegal for an AI. It's okay, well, yeah, that's a new law I, we can make, assume, right? Is you that, know, you know? There's certain humans, you know, with fan fiction have, you know, dove, you know, played around with stuff. 
But, but I mean, there it's not commercial, right? It's, it's not commercial. Right. Yeah, it's not commercial. Exactly. Yeah, right. Let's say we agree that this there don't need to be many new laws here, and kind of the existing fair use framework is sufficient. I guess that does seem to lead to a lot of potential challenges in you know the creative fields and the workforce that generates art and for games and scripts for films and you know songs going forward right so do we think that's inevitable essentially that the like creative industries are going to need less people to generate this type of content I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, part of what Max was saying in the beginning is sort of the democratizing effect that it that could allow. Or yeah, sorry, yeah, James, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you guys run together. No, <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah, exactly. They, the, the, it's giving sort of people with less capabilities the tools to to do more, which could just, hurt just, com- big companies, right? I just, I guess I just think there is a different discussion to be had around people who own copyright and how that affects their you know future works versus people who don't own copyright but right. do work for companies generating creative output, you know, and how that, what their lives will look like going forward, what their work streams will look like. I mean, we don't want a world where all future creative content is just echoes of what (laughs) came before and humans stop. But that, that also kind of gets to whether LLMs can be creative. If you believe that LLMs are capable of original output, then that won't be the case, right? right? Yeah, you're right. There's an argument that we could be in a renaissance of quickly all these new yeah. art types we've never experienced. It doesn't or feel like, like, or like Dolly the, uh, and stuff are producing that yet, right? Do you think this I is mean, I don't know. It, it, I think that if you prompt these LLMs correctly and spend some time on it, it's not like 100% of the time you'll get creative output. But I believe it is possible to get it to generate new ideas. Listen, and if you want to be in a museum, you can put up a green painting on the wall and call it art but you need to have a really pretentious explanation for what <laughs> the point was and where it's in conversation with everything else <laughs> and these machines cannot produce cannot. any <laughs> sort of like narrative for why they're doing what they're doing so it is not it's this not is, art this is elcher here <laughs> the original but, green painting man yeah. Yeah. but max to max's point if the studio exec can just use this tool to generate commercially viable ideas for movies (laughs) that are better than anyone on the staff has generated. I I think that alone is an interesting right you know, well, commercial generation is oh we should do star wars plus right uh, but that's yeah. what that person is optimizing <laughs> right, for right, theoretically right. i mean but yeah all right i wanted to ask if you could like you know dream up poss- you know with using generative ai some like sequel to a favorite work <laughs> like what would you like to see or what would most excite you that feels like in reach because of some of the stuff we've talked about. I guess I can answer that I feel like, you know, TV shows that maybe ended before their prime or something, right? I'm trying to think what a good example of that is, but, or, or here, like here's an example. Firefly exa- is a famous Yeah, one, Firefly, right? everyone says. I liked it. It wasn't life-changing, but but let's talk about Lost or something, right? If I could, you know, I thought the ending was like not great, but not as not as terrible as the internet believes, but I would be happy to go rerun the last season, right? Wouldn't that be cool to see if you could create, you know, a hundred different versions of the ending of Lost? I love that idea. I love the idea that, you know, like... The, I, first of all, I quit loss at the end of season two being like they can never pay this off. So I'm very <laughs> proud of that. But the idea that like, you know, with Game of Thrones and stuff where like clearly the author really can like puzzle out the like solution that they need. But it feels like there should be some right answer that you like throw an LLM at it. Oh, maybe I mean, there's a right answer think, that exists. I, like, I think if they could redo the last season of Game of Thrones, that would not be a terrible idea. Right, whether or not, yeah, 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 like whether or not the writer, yeah, right, yeah. whether or not R.R. R. Martin is giving them guidance or someone right, else, right, but right. I think that would be a good one to rerun. Can you use the generative AI as the excuse? Who cares if it's actually better than like some random writer? It's, oh, well, we have this new technique. I mean, it's not really a sequel for me, but I think it would be possible to create just like really awesome music that I love, right? That's personalized, right? I think that, again, I'm not like, if it's trained on a bunch of copyrighted material and artists should be paid for it, and I'm cool with that. I'm, I'm figuring out how to pay this AI company, but just like the pure product itself, it would be really cool to have personalized 
music, you know, on demand that really just hit the sweet spot for me or whatever, right? I mean, I just think that would be so cool. And I think not that hard from a, I mean, conceptual perspective, just train an LLM or not an LLM, but a music generation model on everything Max loves, everything he's listened to more than 10 times in his life or whatever in his Spotify library, right? I just think that would be awesome. I, I don't know. That'd be really cool. Well, you could also mm. imagine a world, I guess. I mean, so you're talking, I think about like novel sounding art, right? Not the Drake example in that yeah, case, right? Yeah, right. I don't um, need another Kanye album. We kind of yeah, work out think, that well. well yeah. sure. <laughs> but like another Beatles album, I think a lot of people, there mm. would be a market for that, right? But right. Yeah. I do think, you know, maybe this ends up looking a lot like the fan fiction communities where anyone can create a new Beatles album. You just can't right. sell it, right? You can't. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that would be pretty sweet too. Like, I know, right? Yeah. Shareware Beatles albums. Like, can you just have a ranking of the best ones basically I mean, yeah what, what, do you forecasting culture do you think i mean you can imagine yeah people get to like refresh you, you know you get a personalized version of every episode or you don't like the take it's like a magic eight ball and you're like oh my god take it again like <laughs> i that seems so culturally like hollow to me i guess it's very exciting to me where you could create new art like i think my answer to this would just be i mean i just think the NPC, like creative npcs like where you're actually engaging with them. Like any game, just like any open world, you know, you can just imagine playing, right. I, I don't well, know, yeah. any well, Horizon Zero Dawn, where like they're real characters and they have yeah. sort of their own agendas that are different in every right. game. And um, to bring this back to the last fake tech trend, which was like the metaverse, right? The metaverse populated by a bunch of characters that, you know, aren't that flexible or interesting, I don't think is that exciting, but the metaverse in a world where you can run into an infinite number of digital characters that have interesting stories that you can go on interesting quests and missions with and, and compete and collaborate with. I just think is, I mean, I want to hang out with other people in, a, in an AR VR world as well, but I think hanging out with really cool, interesting non-player characters that are powered by LLMs is just a really fun idea too. And so I just think Ready Player One is way more fun if half the people in Ready Player One are like interesting conversational, you know, AI driven characters. Also because AI will be much happier to spend tons of time in the metaverse <laughs> than regular people. And so you could actually populate it with them versus yeah, forcing sure. to strap on. There you go. They're always on. <laughs> we haven't talked about movies as much as I mm. thought we would. I'm curious. I guess I'm personally skeptical. Like the movie business is anywhere is near affected in the near term. Like maybe I yeah, this sort of I what they sort of, you know, development is changed, but it feels like... I do think like just f that seems to be Effects. just driven. It seemed, yeah, I mean, the generative uh, video space is like very early, right? I, from the current technology, but it's still amazing. And so they, uh, Listen, I my prediction just, on the first episode was the TikToks being revolutionary. Right. So, yeah. yeah, right. I mean, I just don't like, I think this sort of bums me out as someone who watched a lot of movies growing up, but I just sort of think the movie business is in like a secular decline. And I think all these other types of content are like, eating it up, whether it's like short form video or television series or TikTok or AI generated TikTok. And I mean, as we discussed at the beginning, gaming is bigger than all these things put together because it turns out like having some interactivity and some form of you know play as part of your entertainment experience makes it more fun and makes it more engaging. So I just think that movies are a sort of almost like anachronistic type of content. I know that's a really hot take, but this idea that you have a two hour thing that right. like you don't interact with that has, if a sequel comes out, if ever, it comes out five years later and it's also only two hours long right. and it's not personalized in any way. And also the business model is falling apart because nobody wants to go to theaters anymore. So they can only make Marvel movies basically now. So it's just not, it's caught between a lot of factors that are bad for the future of what we think of as films or movies, right? And I think, right. you know, TV has already been eating movies throughout our lifetime where I think most of the like prestige dramas that have come out in the last you know 10 or 20 years have a lot of them moon on tv which like never happened before 2000 and then i think also i think gaming will start to eat into that and i think you know short form video whether it's tiktok or youtube or, or some ai generated version of these things will just start to eat into that also so i guess yeah the sort of depressing take is i don't think movies like matter anywhere near as much as they once did which is why i think the other stuff's more interesting to talk about right yeah <laughs> that's some well, very depressing yeah, on movies i'm sorry it feels like areas where you can iterate a, a, i mean short form video is just so perfect because you can right. really test it out like the machines can learn from it whereas yeah movies require a ton of intention and sort of broad thinking which is still the domain 
of humans. So I don't know if everyone in the movie business would be so depressed by what you're saying. It's like, oh, yeah, the real art, sort of the long form thinking is a little more insulated than the let's run an A-B test and see how people yeah. react to things. And so there, there's some good in that, too. Definitely. I mean, I still think there will be great movies throughout our lifetime, but I think that where the new tools are coming into play is in categories where, yeah, maybe the movie makers aren't that interested in. Or if we really believe in the extension of the gaming discussion we had at the beginning and we can create extremely intelligent NPCs, can you just put them in simulations that are fun to watch in the mm. same way people watch <laughs> reality shows right. or, you know, watch films and TVs that the stories are so compelling that, but they're just occurring because they, there's a simulation running. I don't know. Maybe that's where we are. That would be a fun. Yeah. The real housewives I, I of open it. AI here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No patent that. Yeah. 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 yeah that sounds Stay good. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> Little big brother, but just with AI running around. Yeah. yeah. Or, and, and, and then, you know, you're essentially able to iterate through thousands of different reality scenarios, right? Throw an island in there or <laughs> a rose ceremony, whatever it is. All right, stay tuned. I have Amy and Keith up next. Welcome. Keith, Amy, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much, Eric. Yeah, thanks for having us. Amy, I, I thought, I mean, we'd start off with you just as sort of the venture capitalist who sees things broadly um, can you talk a bit about your interest in gaming? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a lifelong passion, really. Uh, I haven't worked in the game industry, but have been you know playing games. Um, I was a gamer growing up and uh, played a lot of you know early um, like you know first person shooters like the Doom and the um, Wolfenstein era games to like CS and then Diablo era to more of the modern day and um, and as an investor. Um, you know, first, what an industry. Like, I love that you get it's like, oh, well, we did all these fun things and that's part of the credit of it. Like, uh, I should spend more time in gaming anyway. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. It really is. I mean, it's pretty important, I think, because um, especially if you decide to invest in content, uh, first of all, it's really difficult. And and there are people playtesting really like hundreds, if not thousands, of games every year. But it is really important to um to play them because then you can get kind of a feel for what really exceptional looks like. In different genres, yeah. In, in terms on the investing side, didn't you you invested in Epic at one point? Is that right? Um, That's right. Yeah. Well, um, I think the first foray was actually when I was at Insight. This is like ten years ago now, when um, Insight was um, majority owner of Jagex um, RuneScape, and and that was like an early uh, experience because I I still remember when um, when there was like a big monetization change in the game, and everyone sort of the players were like outraged and. And they kind of saw that, you know, Insight was uh, a big shareholder. And so then, you know, there were like bomb threats called into the fund. Um, oh, my God. And yeah, people were <laughs> players. I mean, yeah, it was a great example of just how in intensely passionate gamers are about their games and, and changes to it. Like, um, and so uh, then later on, you know, I joined Lifespeed and one of my mandates was actually investing in games. Uh, and games there and we did early stage investments in companies like you know far away which is web3 side um really experienced game makers from scopely and then um and then also like triple a studios like 1047 and, and um and lost lake games and others and also growth stage there was epic games and then also um triple dot studios which is a mobile studio and then on, on the crypto side i mean i'm sure there are other things but i mean it's yugo labs right the board ape company i mean part of the investment thesis there Yugo labs yeah what is it you got right? Okay, yeah. Um, that you were gonna that they were are we're going to build out sort of games and sort of in an entertainment world around that. Is that right? Or how much was games part of investing in them? In the Yugo round, um, and this was early last year. Um, I think that first and foremost, the exciting thing was that with Board Yacht Club, and then you know they then acquired um, CryptoPunks and a couple of other brands. It was the, I would say, the blue chip brand in the NFT space. Yeah. And so there was a lot of um, value in that and that they could turn into potential like consumer products that a lot on um, that both NFT holders and aspirational NFT holders could use and love. And, and so games was a, a big um, part of that strategy. All right, Keith, tell, tell, just give us a little bit of your overview. You have a stealth startup, which, you know, 
uh, amazing, you know, when I'm prying that you're going to be able to ducking and dodging on some of that. But give give people a little bit of your background in the games industry. Yeah, sure. So um, actually, just before before I got into games, uh, I did five years in the U.S. Army uh, artillery and, and special operations. Um, and I, I bring that up because it, it's it's unexpectedly like kind of come back as, as part of my life in games. Hmm. Um, but for the last 12, 15 years, um, I've been in the games industry, uh, at startups, uh, mostly later stage startups. Uh, so, you know, past the kind of zero to one point, um, more at the growth phase, um, as well as like larger conglomerates. So companies like Kabam in the early days of, uh, web, Facebook, and then mobile gaming, uh, GRI International, the subsidiary of, you know, the large social network GRI uh, in Japan. Uh, Wargaming, I'm actually uh, visiting some old friends and colleagues uh, here at the Wargaming office right now, uh, makers of uh, you know, the phenomenal World of Tanks. Um, and mm. then most recently was at uh, AppLovin, where I led the games business there uh, through our Yo, what, IPO. Speaking the language of actual, in particular games, because I think you know not everybody follows like the games business. Like, yeah, what, yeah, for what sure. were the games that ended up defining a lot of your career in terms of spending time? Yeah, so um, you know, I've I love every, and I, I mean this very generally, I love every game that I've been a part of um, in, in one way or another, even those that have, uh, like if he was kind of sharing, uh, resulted in some funny real world circumstances, like uh, getting getting offices firebombed and threatened and stuff like that. Even that is actually just a, a symptom of the passion that exists within right. the industry. And I, I share that passion as a gamer as well. Maybe not to the violent ends, but yeah. <laughs> um, so so games, games is what people would know. So um, marquee games for me, um, you know, the first game I ever worked on uh, was a game called Last Chaos, which is a Korean developed MMORPG that we were publishing uh, over in the West. Uh, no, not many people know about it. Like if you weren't one of the 100,000 or so people that tried it, like you wouldn't know. But it's it it speaks to the longevity and some other elements of the industry because that game is still alive today, uh, believe it or not. Hmm. Um, but games that people would know. So Kings of Camelot uh, would have been, uh, you know, an early mobile Actually, first Facebook and then uh, early mobile um, 4X strategy game uh, that I spent some time on. Um, and then also at Kabam, uh, you know, as a part of a number of IP uh, tie-in games as well. So we did Marvel Contest of Champions. Hmm. Um, we did a couple of, while I was there, we did a couple of um, Fast and the Furious uh, titles as well. Um, and then, let's see... Next, uh, Wargaming, so World of Tanks, World of Warships, uh, you know, there's pretty big titles in the shooter space uh, or in the strategic shooter spaces, as yeah. we used to say back then. Um, and then most recently, oh, sorry, I almost forgot, actually, uh, the most played game that I've ever had the pleasure to work on and, and with is Subway Surfers. Uh, mm. with the, uh, oh my God, every over, TikTok over video, over. right? Is, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it is the most <laughs> downloaded, I believe it is the most single downloaded game ever. Uh, wow. It's, it, you know, it counts its installs in the multiple billions. Uh, and so what's your the portion of the human race like has played that game at one time or another? Do you have a typical role in these games, or like how would you describe what you tend what you, the role? You yeah. Played? So early, early in my career, um, I was on the product management and design side, so very hands on, individual contributor. Um, but then was quickly leading teams. So like I led the team, uh, you know, kind of as the general manager on Kingdoms of Camelot uh, pretty early in my career. Um, and then since then, so that would have been, you know, maybe five years into my 12, 12 ish year stint. Um, I've been more on the corporate executive side. So at, you know, Wargaming, uh, I built and, and ran the mobile division. Um, at AppLovin, I ran the games business. Uh, and so as, as these things happen, like I became further away from kind of directly involved in the creation operations and more on the business side. And, and now, uh, you're, now you're thrust back, what, like, exactly, you're exactly, exactly two person, where I be, one honestly. and a half person, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, 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 um, I'll tell you, like, but there's nothing better in the industry than like actually touching uh, a game than actually, you know, touching consumers in that way. Um, you know, that's what I think we all get in this industry for. And so I'm happy to be back. And I, I might poke at more what you're doing at the end, but broadly, Fair to say there's like a game development type approach rather than a particular game. Uh, what do you mean by that? What you're what you're working on now. Are you building a game? Like is your company a game like building a particular game? No. So we're we will build games, but oh, okay. our mission is more about um ushering forth what we see as this 
like new generation of games uh, empowered by AI. Um, and so that's that's what our roughly our mission is. Uh, right, that'll involve uh, making I, games and involves yeah, making we find like, into the underlying of technology. That. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, like I'm not um, that us being stealth and and not sharing is not because I don't want to. It's actually more as we I think talked about before the call um, or before you started. Uh, it's more that I struggle to concisely explain what it is that we're doing so, so you can practice so look, hey, you open the door i'm gonna try to explain and <laughs> yeah. stumble way way through so yeah nothing's off the table okay cool we'll come back to that amy can you give a sense of why we think something's gonna happen with artificial intelligence in gaming or like what what you mm-hmm. see the promise is like you know in investing there can be a sense like oh new things happened it's an inflection point like let's plug it into like our favorite thing but it does feel like with gaming in particular there's sort of a lot of optimism. I'm curious, like, what what you think will make what's is it what's happening in generative AI with like the image generation, or what what in particular do you think is important here? Yeah, I can break it down. Um, so and also, you know, Keith can give so many examples. Um, where he probably used AI in all of his games, but um, AI in the gaming industry has kind of been around since the beginning of games like back in i don't know 50s 60s like starting with arcade right because um you know fundamentally you're playing against uh an opponent a lot of times and before there was you're playing against a human you're playing against a bot and um and then with bots against other bots and so right. that now is captured under kind of like um you know non-playable character ai um as a definition but this concept of business games for multiple decades of time Right. Um, and that's so, the NPC yeah. and probably when the most regular people or like, you know, as a gamer, you'd be like, the AI is like sucks or like, you you know, famously, I think like Mario Kart where the AI just like is taught to like slingshot to catch up if you're too far ahead and all that. Yeah. So we've all we've all and like if you play a game too much, you sort of learn the mind or whatever the rules are of the NPCs. Um, so, yeah, that's an that's an exciting opportunity because you're. You interact with them and you sort of get to know how they think. So that that's certainly one. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, exactly. And and I think um well we'll we'll hit the categories first and then we'll go back into sort of the evolution of each of these. The other the other one is um asset generation, um, which also has had a history in games. Cause back as far as, you know, it was like Diablo and maybe even before, um, the concept of procedural generation of different levels. So, you know, you're playing like an um, action RPG and you're playing um, different like, you know, dungeon levels and and they're actually procedurally generated. So, you know, it might actually look different, for example, for different people each time you go into a particular dungeon has been a concept that's been baked into game engines for a very long time, um, which uh, which I think like the modern, I would say like the post like last fall, like LLM um, version of these categories has been how do you use um, large language models in these categories um because ai has been actually using games for a very long time um and then the newest category which you know, keith is you know building in is what what about applying large language models to generating code that creates games so taking that in terms of asset generation one step further into actually game logic as well um and uh people haven't done it yet and so it's like a, an exciting hypothetical space um i mean people are starting to build like basic games in that space but um and i think you know, and we'll get to it, but the questions here are like, one, there is, you know, a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. I think some people in the games industry um, would say kind of like an overhype of of the capabilities of AI, um, you know, ahead of where the actual technology is um, in some cases. And in other cases, people say, oh, yeah, this is the inevitable next step in evolution of that. And that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, AI devs are so excited because um, there's no... Uh, the concept doesn't need to be explained as exists in this industry for a long time. But I think what everyone needs to remember is that, you know, the bar for creating content in games is so high and and new technology is only like a part of that. It's a space where really content is king. And it's just about like, you know, can you play, can you produce better content? That sort of fits into a big question for me, which is, you know, I think there's this trend of like the democratization of gaming or the sense that like, you know, Roblox or you know whatever you're trying to like maybe help the user create games or you're trying or on the other hand on mobile that there's just sort of a we can make a bunch of games sort of cheaply and see what works and then invest in that is is that a true sort of narrative or 
it, at the end of the day, are most people just flocking towards premium games that are really thought through with like the best techniques? Like, what what's sort of the optimism for this sort of democratization story in gaming, and how much do you think AI is is going to move? sort of us closer one way or the other. One thing that is easy to forget, and, and I am guilty of this as well, uh, even having been in the industry for all these years, is just how big and broad like the industry is, especially on the consumer side, right? It's something like four bill, three, four billion people, I don't know what the number is, now play games. So that's like, you know, a sizable portion of the human race. It is not like, you know, 20 years ago, you would have said like, when we said gamer, uh, you know, you would have thought of some like, 30 or 20 something year old guy in his mom's basement or something like that. That's just not true anymore, right? It's a very diverse market. Of right, and games are bigger population. than the movie business and everything. Exactly, right. it's like movies, yeah. music, TV, you put it all together, games is bigger. So it's like the largest form of entertainment that exists. And so all of those kind of use cases that you mentioned um, are real and are big. So hyper casual gaming, which is something that you kind of touched on as these like high volume uh, kind of mobile launches. Like that's actually a, a large category unto itself, something like 40 to 60% of the installs across the mobile platform, which is the biggest platform in gaming or hyper casual style game. But that's not to say like you still have Diablo releases like billion dollar franchises that launch. So all of that exists and all of that is part of game. Nice when a business is big enough that you're like, oh, we can go after one or the other. They're both promising. I mean, I'm curious like which, whether you think, um, yeah, the high-end gaming or sort of the sort of cheaper, sort of more democratized game creation is is going to be helped by the trends that we're seeing here. So I think um, all, all of it will be helped, right. but not equally, right? And not in the same way. So the high-end, you know, what we think of as AAA, but actually there's probably a bunch of titles that we wouldn't consider AAA, but meet this, what I, what I call it, like the high complexity kind of side of the spectrum. Um, uh, so that can, you know, triple A is typically like high complexity on the fidelity side, but there are games that are <laughs> high complexity in the kind of puzzle formation or other things that are behind the scene or the multiplayer side of things. So those, those are all in the same bucket. Um, I expect those types of games, I expect for us to get more of those games with AI, more of them produced. So increase in productivity, um, increase in creativity, uh, via the use of AI, and then also new um, kind of features and components, like we talked about, like AI, LLM driven NPCs. Um, and then AI also like natural language as an interface, uh, for gaming that will be new as well. Hmm. So I think that, that kind of thing is going to happen on that, you know, high complexity side. Um, I also think that things are going to change a lot on the, um, kind of democratization on the UGC user generated content side of things as well. So some of it will be similar, like natural language as an input, right? Further abstracting and, and thereby democratizing like interaction with, you know, platforms like Roblox or even, you know, more complex professional tools like Unity and Unreal. Um, that will allow a lot more people to engage with the creation of games, uh, you know, from an intent standpoint. In other words, have a game in your head, easier to make it playable. Um, but then I think there's actually, and this is where my company is building towards, we believe that there's a third category that gets born out of all of this, um, which wasn't possible before and comes from the convergence of uh, not just AI, but also a number of other things, uh, which allows for, um, uh, yes, yeah, so for, for, for games and uh, entertainment that look entirely different um, uh, than what we've seen before. Well, okay, different in what way? Or give us a little bit more <laughs> there. Yeah, so so um, uh, so here's where I'll have to struggle through. So like, the way I like to to come at this is from the player perspective. So like, there's been all these things in games that for my entire life as a gamer and all the customers that that you know millions of customers that I've interacted with, or billions really in, in the games that I've made. Um, all of these expectations that we've had, these unmet expectations. And they keep being unmet and it's just so disappointing and sad. Um, and so things like the fact that games are largely a finite experience. So even World of Warcraft still around, right? Or, or that early MMO I talked about that's still around. Yes, it's true. But like, if you ask anybody that plays World of Warcraft, like the amount of content that's being added, some people will even say it's dead, but like even that, which kind of pushes the boundary of finite still feels finite in many very important ways. 
Um, and similar to that would be like unrealized depth. Um, and so you guys touched on this a bit with like procedural generation. And I think it was something you said, Eric, um, where like a player can kind of learn the mind of the NPCs and that gets boring on um, like this feeling of alive. You know, another, another more contemporary example would be uh, Starfield, right? So everybody is super excited for Starfield. Oh my God, another Bethesda game. Amazing, amazing. And it is an amazing game. But what is like, you know, one of the, the often repeated critiques is like, yes, there's a thousand worlds I can go explore but they all feel relatively the same. They feel right. dead, except <laughs> for those few ones. I actually at some point ones. wanted to bring up Starfield as sort of yeah. the red flag for <laughs> AI gaming. Right? <laughs> Just because it's like, oh, we can do everything. You know, we it can be infinite or whatever. You know, the sense that I feel like more and more games are, it's like, oh, maybe the way to win an open world is to be even more open and world, you know. Well, um, and, and, and then, and then it, you lose sort of the story, right? You hand it over to sort of a, you know, uh, some sort of system to generate the world, but then you can't sort of put enough human storytelling in to to power that expanse, I guess. And that's how it's been with kind of, you know, historical and contemporary techniques of procedural generation and others, things we called AI before, but are different from, you know, the large language models, image models, things that are, are being used today. And like, with this also, it's all, so to continue on the things, these unmet expectations, um, like the experiences are also relatively static. In other words, like there is a necessary one size fits all that goes into when you're developing a game, right? I, I can't customize the game for every player. I can create systems. So, you know, you can choose and you can, you can, you know, design your character, your player character in, in Starfield to some extent, right? But you're still limited in your narrative choices. You're still limited in, you know, the, in, in many other things. Um, and then because of the, the natural kind of formation of the industry and how games are developed as well before AI, um, you end up with these fragmented experiences. So like social is fragmented and everybody, like one of my favorite examples of this is like, um, you know, try and play a game with a, uh, one of your friends on PlayStation, another one on PC or something like that. You're like, right. oh, like shit, it's getting better. Right. But, but damn, it is not great. Um, and even beyond that, like if you think about the kind of social interactions you can have inside of a game, those really don't exist across games, um, not even within these you know, small ecosystems like the PlayStation Network or others that do try to create a social grasp across game. And then finally, like what, what kind of summarizes all of this up for me and, and speaks to you know, the direction that, that we're going is games are not personal, right? And I think that, that that's, that's what we view as kind of this new frontier is a is an era of personalized gaming experience. Hmm. So building games for individual level persons for segments or so not even I, I actually think that on this, you know, this third category of gaming that I was describing, uh, this native AI gaming, um, is not it's gonna look very different, not just from a product and consumer perspective, but in a how you build it perspective as well, because um, you know creating an AI game team, a game director, a personal game director who is learning your preferences as you play, much like, you know, Spotify is learning your mm. preferences as you listen, or Facebook is learning your presence, you know, your preferences. Like the as game you're is building your as you're going through it. Exactly. And mm. that's, a, and so, so things still have to get built in order to make that happen. You must create, you know, capabilities within a simulation that an AI game director and game team can work within. On, uh, but like the, what we would have traditionally called creating the game will be very different. And I actually think that, um, this, my, one of my dreams or my hopes is that this actually brings gaming much closer to what our earliest and most free experiences with kind of interactive entertainment probably were, which was like hanging out in the sandbox with your friends, right? Where like, there was no game director when you were in the sandbox, right? There was no like designer. It was like, no, I'm. I'm the spaceman, you're the alien, like, right. boom, boom, I shoot you. Oh, no, I have a force field. Like, that kind of merging or blending or blurring between creator and consumer, I think, comes with this native AI gaming future as well. One of my favorite books is Ender's Game. And, you know, in that... Great book. In that book, <clears throat> in the, you know, he Ender is playing with a computer that creates basically, like, psychological tests for him that sort of evolved to the player where you know the teachers don't even know where the gaming is uh i imagine that's still far away but it is amazing to imagine this world where 
the game is sort of responding to the player and producing um, stuff as it goes. I mean, that, you know, I, I think a lot from the framework of like TikTok, right, where, you know, that's a key sort of AI sort of uh, sorting, you know, sh uh, showing people what they want, running experiments based on how people engage with stuff to see what what should rise to the top. Um, yeah, I guess my the thing that I'd been hung up on with like longer form content is it's just like harder to run those experiments. So even if like, you know, we're able to create like videos from like whole cloth, will like we really have movies that are like A-B tested in that way because it's just like too hard to run the experiments. What I hadn't really imagined is this world you're talking about where like, oh, well, you have somebody in the experience and you can sort of run many experiments on them while they're playing. The movie comparison is an interesting one. And I think that games, in, in this case, we actually have an advantage because there is a lot more signal data that we get from a person playing a game than you are probably going to be able to get right. on you know, the person watching the movie. Amy, could you take the temperature on where you think startups are right now? I imagine you've been sort of meeting with them like... I don't know. Yeah. What's, what are you, where do you, where are you seeing a lot of energy going and sort of how, how, how active is this or like what, yeah, what's your uh, view on sort of the AI game space at the moment in startup world? Yeah. So now that, um, so now, you know, as a partner at Menlo, I've been covering games, um, consumer and games, but, um, in games, obviously, you know, AI is a big part of it. And I would say that the, um, that the, um where startups are and also i would say the game studios uh willingness to adopt right these tools and um and techniques really depends on where which of these kind of categories that we we talked about the three you you have like kind of um npc you've got actually i'm going to swap the order and we start with like asset generation um creation and then npc and then sort of like code generation um, yep. We are kind of in that order of like, I would say, like readiness of adoption because um, on the on the asset generation side. So this is a, this is like taking image models and generating kind of 2D and 3D images. Um, this is kind of like a um, where there's a lot of, I would say, heat from artists because immediately they're like, wow, our our works, um, you know, our um, our works of art are being kind of used to train these models without our permission. And also, you know, are our jobs threatened? Right. And, and for some people, they are actually um, one of the studios when I was at Lightspeed, um, the founder told um, did tell me that, you know, they're actually able to um, reduce the size of their um, 2D artist team by about 50 percent because, um, the, you know, using a number of the tools out there, whether it's like Leonardo or Scenario or a number of these tools, they're actually um, and actually the, the number one tool that people use are actually just mid journey and um, or building on stability, hmm. uh, stable diffusion directly. Um, <laughs> They're able to generate, you know, let's say like um, concept art. Everyone's kind of trying out like, using these tools for concept art, but actually getting some of the 2D assets to a point where it's like, you know, 70% there and then taking it from there. I think where the um, where the hardest problem is is 3D model generation hmm. and um, the model um, or asset generation. So the models really aren't quite there. Yet. Um, and so you have tools out there that, are a combination of, you know, they'll they'll produce a model that say anywhere from like 20 to 50, 60 percent of the way there. Hmm. And then they might actually have be mechanical turking like the, the remainder of the process to get you to like 70 percent. And then your 3D artist takes that mechanical asset. Turk and, as in there are people <laughs> trying to flesh it out. Is that what you're saying? On the company side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, Nobody um, wants to say the word people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I mean, <laughs> Right now, you cannot replace like a 3D artist um, in terms of generating um, because the models just aren't there. But yeah. because that is like the hardest and also the most cost intensive, I think that will really unlock this piece of it. Um, big question from game studios would be, um, well, how do I protect my IP? Because, um, you know, if I um, uh, will my IP be used to train this model, um, you know, not okay with that. Or like if I generate using this model assets, can I actually use them in my game and have it be IP protected? Um, and so I think this is a big kind of area of debate um, right, right now. And um, which and, could and be so helpful for indie type developers, right? If, 
if they don't have anything to lose, they're willing to risk copyright more. You know, it gives you a competitive edge. You can be a little bit looser. Yeah. While, while, you know, big companies are certainly very worried about copyright, both, both you know, whether they're going to hurt their own material, like you're saying, or if they create stuff with uh, these techniques, whether they actually have any copyright claim, right? Because there are some early signs that you don't. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, indie studios, I, if, um, a big part of the thesis uh, with this AI wave right now is that um, cost content is the number one cost in game making. And so you can actually bridge this gap a bit for for indie studios that are early uh, that are like adopting tooling earlier. I think over time it converges. And so then I think like in the end state, um, these tools will actually just make it easier for all creators, uh, sorry, all artists to be creating these assets, which means that the uh, um, the, um, the the artists within these large gaming studios actually just be more efficient. Um, and so I think it's still, um, that may still happen, but there's probably like an early adopter advantage right now. Um, but I think that's kind of predicated on how good these models are. And I think when it comes to putting assets into production, I'm still not hearing almost anybody um, putting in production, people are mostly using tooling on the concept side because um, in terms of animating these um, these assets, uh, particularly if it's 3D, um, it's still, you know, we're still pretty far from that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of asset generation, which is furthest along adoption. And right now we're looking at founders that are enterprise ready, you know, knows how to make enterprise workflows and um, create them and also go to market and, and basically make a created experience and also security and privacy that really um, game studios need, particularly on the larger side. Do we see a foundation model for gaming? Like, has have there been companies that are trying to like do the open AI thing specifically for gaming, or are they mostly just trying to build off of Dolly, <clears throat> Midjourney, and other sort of general general tools? The image models are very good, um, you know, in terms of uh, what's what's out there now and also like, you know, kind of developments on the open source front. I think where a game specific model becomes interesting is around generating code. Uh, hmm, right. and, and the question there is like, well, what are they training the data from? Because, you know, um, game code is is um, is basically IP that's held within gaming companies, mostly large gaming companies that are very incentivized to having that be in kind of like the open public property so that other studios can actually use that to generate games. And so um, I think that is a, a big open question, but current models really aren't trained to be able to generate both the, neither the specificity of code nor kind of like the complexity in terms of knowing like, well, what makes a fun game versus just like an average not fun right. game? Um, and because it's really like at the outlier is where you actually have, you know, where the fun is created and that cr- produces these large outcomes. Yeah. All right. The the non-player character, the AI in the game. I mean, I think it's such a fun thing to think about for the reasons I was talking about earlier. You know, people have very much experienced it. I mean, and and just given the charm, you know, the fact that people think they're dealing with a real being when, you know, you're interacting with a character bot or, or whatever, or like, you know, famously uh, the Google employee at Lambda, like, feels like once people are interacting with 3D NPCs that have some of this LLM technology behind it, it's going to be mind-blowing. Yeah, I, I'm i curious, like, Keith, like, from game design, like, what... Are, are we going to get, like, a sort of, I don't know, like, a, what's it called? Um, Grand Theft Auto? Is Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead or something going to have just, like, totally free thinking LLMs like running around or do you think that would break these games or like how likely is it that somebody could just plug in like sort of much more independent minded NPCs into sort of how we think about traditional open world games? Yeah. So, um, personally, I don't think the NPC, so I think the NPC thing will happen. However, I don't think it will be as or at least in the narrow way that i imagine most people think of it which is like like you were saying like a grand theft auto and like all of the people walking around are a lot right um, i think that 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 will come a, probably not if, if you know the um kind of development timelines at rockstar and how long they've been working <laughs> on the latest one like, right. like I, it would be shocked if they kind of shoehorn it in here at, at the end 
Um, but we'll see it in games for sure. However, I think that if you um, broad, how, I don't think it'll be like that big unto itself because the question, there's all of these follow on questions. So once you have like an LLM able to interact with the creativity that we've seen in applications like ChatGPT, but within a game world, the just interacting at a, at a, at a language conversational level, eh, Right. Like, I don't know it's that like, anybody's what freedom really does care. the LLM have? Exactly. What right, agency exactly. does it right. have? So I think when you start talking about uh, maybe a, a more broad, like, um, uh, kind of description would be like an independent agents acting within the game that are able to actually have an uh, impact on the simulation itself, on the gameplay experience itself, more than just like what we've, what we're used to with NPCs, where like they might have a set of kind of actions that they take or if it's a bot that you're playing against you know it plays like you, beyond that to something that is more material maybe more towards you know think of the difference between an npc in an rpg and a dungeon master in an right. in a D game right well, that, like well then one is, that's when it starts to feel like the matrix you know you've got agent smith in the game <laughs> you're shooting against it and then if the game developer has empowered this ai system to like you know change the rules or in some way that would uh yeah, be pretty mind altered or an easy way to break games, you know, uh, in unpredictable exactly. ways. And, and, <laughs> and what I'd like to do is actually link this to what Amy was just saying. And and for um, all of the, you know, developer, like game developers out there and, and to give a little hint and some of the technical solutions that we're exploring right now. Um, I totally agree with what Amy was saying about generating code. Um, it's something that we've been experiencing as we've been uh, testing out different models uh, to, to try and generate code. But there is... Like, I think this falls under the definition of code, but it's different in an important way, which is data. So like, oftentimes a game simulation is a set of code, um, which describe like, which describes all the interactions or which is interpreting data. And so a lot of game design actually happens at a data level and LLMs are already, so your foundational model, pre-trained LLMs, Llama, GPT-4, whatever, are already very good at data. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, like, um, you know, take a game, uh, Call of Duty, right? Um, there is like a whole bunch of Call of Duty is code, but then a whole bunch of Call of Duty is data. And the part that's data is like the, the um, configuration, the data that configures the weapon that you have. So you have an M4 and it's got like a, an attack power of 50 in right. a range of like 35. That, hmm. those numbers are data. And you so can- So then you could easily like, say like, come up with different guns or something. Is yes, it, yeah, exactly. Right. So right. that is already within very much within the capabilities of the models that we see today right. is the ability to take natural language, understand game design, understand is anthropomorphizing, but like to take natural language and effectively translate it into functional, contextually relevant data inside of an existing simulation. Right. So you could have way more skins like, oh, it generate us a bunch of skins, generate. And, right. and there where you have the constraints, <laughs> you know it's not going to destroy your game. Maybe you, you can review it Precisely. before yeah, yeah. Um, versus like my sort of Agent Smith, like wild futurist sort of thing is like, okay, l yeah, let like an actually, AI Matrix run rampant a... in, in the game and like uh, mess with it. Uh, yeah. Uh, a little Matrix is control. actually a great example because like, you know, kind of foundational, at least in the original Matrix was this idea of, you know, Neo as the one and right. um, the agents could break the simulation, right? right? They worked outside of the simulation. What we're saying here explicitly is like, yeah, sure, that's cool in movies and all that, but like an agent working within the simulation can actually be very powerful depending on how expansive your simulation is. And so to like wrap it back to the NPC, beyond just having a, an interesting conversation, if an NBC agent inside of a game has the ability to change data, that can actually feel like, pretty significant in terms of, um, you know, the world feeling alive and things like that. As a matter of fact, if you looked at like Starfield, right, and I don't know this to be true hundred percent, but I would guess it to be so a lot of what's going into the design of those worlds that don't feel so much alive or the ones that do, the big difference is the worlds that don't feel alive were procedurally, the data was procedurally generated and the worlds that do feel alive were hand designed by people to feel so, but all within the same simulation. And so really just a difference in data. Yeah, on the NPC side, um, part of the conversation is that you have to remember NPCs are pretty good today. You know, people, this, this is what it, players have been interacting with for the last, you know, few decades. And so there are 
um, certain genres of games in which kind of AI NPCs, which is moving from like a decision tree model for an NPC to right. a more open, like kind of LLM model for NPC is actually discernible to justify the increased costs, right, around um, having that kind of deployment would be in specific genres, I would say, like, you know, um, open world and RPG being some of the most obvious ones and where we are seeing, you know, new studios being born with that approach. Um, They're like, we're going to build a game where we're differentiated by our characters yeah. being LLMs or they're going to sell Correct. LLM techniques to other other people. Um, so it's like, so there's, there's a lot in between yeah, there and tons, I would say yeah. there's, yeah, there's like studios that are saying, all right, we're going to have, um, these, uh, we're going to have AI NPC based, uh, characters that interact with you that, uh, um, that actually will like enrich, like where the, the stories, um, might actually evolve like in, in, in gameplay that starts getting really closely tied to, um, well, how does like, you know, game code also evolve um you know dynamically to to keith's point and i think a lot of this theoretical and what a lot of these game devs need to figure out is um at what at what point do you give all those degrees of freedom and where do you actually just codify in the systems which is you know how um game making is done today right. uh, because yeah because it's a cost consideration and then there's also the um controlling the player experience part of it as well you know if you actually have a, ver a locked in decision tree you know like you are creating player <laughs> paths right. for these different segments of players and you're really optimizing your their experience you have a lot of control there and where is giving up some of that control actually a good thing so i would say like you know large studios when i talk to them on the npc side are like we're gonna do kind of like proof of concepts um, maybe with our smaller games, maybe with the new game and see um, whether it actually impacts and improves the player experience and then translates to like longer player retention and higher kind of lifetime values and how much players are spending in the game, et cetera. Before we make the determination that it is completely game changing and we're going to change all of our NPC systems um, across the games. Um, yeah, again, I think this gives an opportunity for a startup that wants to go a lot more further in this and um and especially with their core ip than where the incumbents are taking it so it's an exciting De definitely i can see the risks for like a big developer one like you like you know with microsoft and sydney or whatever you, you don't know what the lms will say if you're just like sending out a game and you like uh free response from NP npcs could be like terrifying and two i imagine it's got to be like much riskier for just like creating bugs in a game where you don't know the whole decision tree and you introduce a part of a system that's basically like trying to come up with a bunch of wild answers uh, that you haven't uh, gamed out before. But I mean, as a consumer, I desperately want it. Like, you, you know, it, I feel like this sense that like this game could come off the rails or that you would have like an AI that's like feels wild or moving to our third category. I'm glad we have such like a good framework, like assets, NPCs, and sort of the, the actual games being and code generated by with help from AI. Do we have like the first like AI game or like what are what is the sort of state of play right now in terms of games sort of from whole cloth or components of games that are like human fairly out of the loop? I expect us to begin on the the game generation side at the lowest level of complexity possible. I mean, it just makes sense to start there. Um, the funny thing is, is actually, it, you don't have to get very high on the complexity spectrum before you start to be capable of generating a large portion of the games that are actually played. So if you think hmm. of you know, categories of gaming, especially on mobile, categories such as social casino, puzzle, I mean, puzzle is like a multi-billion dollar category, social casino is as well, um, uh, with, with billions of players. Uh, if you think of like 2D, right, is actually a low complexity game um, uh, because it is like uh, pixel graphics and sprite sheets and like two dimensional and all of that. Um, uh, so like RPGs, top down strategy games, like again, like there's actually a lot of gameplay that exists under that um, level. And so we and might look, see this revolution in like 2D gaming, like obviously mobile is popular yeah. right now, but also if we're saying, okay, 3D assets are really hard. We want to democratize. We're closer, you know, with with sort of 
yeah, lower production type games. Like it could mean a bunch of really cool like well, and you look and at you look at games games slash platforms like Roblox and Minecraft, right? That again were low complexity on the fidelity still or largely low complexity on the fidelity side, but we're able to go very deep on kind of the gameplay and systems and customization and and creation and all of that. Um, yeah, I think that that's where a lot of the kind of, well, I'll call it visible innovation will happen um, because of the the problems that like Amy was talking about earlier, right? Creating 3D models, rigging those models, like from a generative perspective, um, visual effects, all of that shit. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's entire teams of people at AAA studios that are working on like simulating better, more realistic, like hair movement and, and stuff like that, right? Hmm, that's going to continue. Right. AI will right, That's the that, classic. But that's like be... every Pixar movie is like, we've invented a new way for curly hair to move. And like, that's the technical exactly. achievement and, and, underpinning the and movie. And that stuff yeah. is, is ultimately meaningful when it's accumulated all together, for totally. sure. Um, uh, but it's, it, that, that type of advancement would be less obvious. But yes, I think on the, the, the kind of code generation side um, within this, within this three-step framework, um, you know, it's going to start at the low complexity side. And so what we've already, what we're seeing is we are seeing some early experiments kind of hit around Twitter. So you had, you know, people are using, and actually I've done this as well. It's one of the things that got me really excited. And I recommend anybody out there that, you know, wants to dabble in this space, go do it is you can sit down with ChatGPT right now and through like not one shot, but recursively build a game. Like I've done, I've played Twitter. D&D with, uh, yeah, I've done that. I love yeah. it. Yeah. 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 I've played exactly. D&D with ChatGPT too. Yeah, it's fun. exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> so that's already happening, right? And then I'm talking right. even generating code. I've that tried is then to play poker with it too, though it's sort of like in in visual consistent. or like just chapter, just just like, like in, in you a know, text format. in the text format. Um, I felt with D and D just to stew on it for a second. I the memory problems are oh, what yeah. drive me crazy. It's just like mm-hmm. that it forgets it, and that you sort of have to try and remind it. Um, but it's so fun to have ChatGPT like make itself a character and everything. Yeah. What would be fairly probably easy is for you to spit out a, a really like via chat GPT to spit out a, a fairly simple Python simulation or, you know, pick another code base, but Python seems to work reasonably well. That sets up like the framework for a D and D and then to use like GPT four as the kind of language model within that simulation. And you could do that and you'll have like, um, you know, you'll have a, uh, a, a better working like D and D kind of, uh, game that you created. Right. Uh, and, and so that's, that's there. Um, there's a few, you know, if you want to check out FRVR, um, uh, and I know the, the founders over there, um, you know, they've been working on this thing called FRVR Forge. They have some demos out, some videos out. I think they're starting to let some people, I believe they're a game film and some people were able to play with it where it's actually like, so natural language prompt based, you put it in and, and you start to, um, generate like games, uh, playable like wow. experiences. Yeah. It's um, a cool experience. and there are, there's a number of startups that are also like 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 us working on on this stuff as well, and I expect in like the coming year. My my guess is next year we'll start to see a lot of these, um, you know, hit more of a a broader production and and see like what what they can do. It takes like three to five years plus to develop a AAA game, right? Right. I think some of the more yeah. um yeah casual games will be faster. So like you know maybe they're I'm actually at Unreal Fest in New Orleans right now, like seeing like what maps could be created with these kind of tools. Huh. Um, on UEFN, like that'll be interesting because that'll take that'll be faster to market. Uni, what was it? UEFN, the Unreal like Fortnite creator. Oh, okay, okay. For, for Fortnite, cool. yeah. Do you do you have a do you have a sense, just like armchair, of which big sort of game developers will be most forward thinking, or where where you see the most aggression in terms of embracing what's going on? I have a straw man. Obviously, you know a lot of this is like secret a lot of places but my sense is that like a lot of new tech um asia developers were faster to it so hmm. you know netty's tencent i think both of the companies are developing their own um like large language and image models and um have been experimenting with all the tool tooling and um you know they were some of their they were some of um asia uh, developers um were some of the first like for come to us like were the first to kind of put um, higher quality, I would say, like, you know, games, uh, blockchain games out um, live. And uh, and so I think they've been they've been they've been moving it and they've been experimenting kind of for years in the AI space as well. Keith, I mean, I wanted to just like come back to your company for a second. Like, I don't know, in two years, what do you think? What is the first like thing that you provide or like what's I know there's a lot of sort of ambition there, but just 
sort of in terms of something concrete, like what do you think the first move for you, you all is? Yeah. So we're, um, the first move might actually be a B2B solution. I think there are many like areas inside gaming right now where on, um, you know, our technology can provide a, a, a solve a very real problem that, that some, uh, some studios and publishers have that are creating or publishing games of that low complexity threshold. The thing that really excites me though, and, and you said two years, so, so that gives me more space to work in because I expect next year for us to be executing on B2B is this, you know, like lower complexity games that are creating themselves as you play. I do think that we are, um, you know, within two years of, of us being able to launch games like that. And honestly, we're not going to be the only ones. Uh, so I'd expect to see a, a number of games like that on the market within two years. And do you, well, you'll be designing some of it. You'll be like, oh, it's a subway surfer game, but the AI is free to do this thing. Or you think from sort of the beginning in some way, the AI is. The way that we're doing it is we are designing kind of the, the foundational capabilities. Um, it's sort of like, you know, if you think of, um, uh, think of chat GPT, right? And GPT-4 and, and language models, right? They are attempting to predict the next work, right? And, and what has been just so amazing, like so unexpectedly, at least for me, like surprising is that in trying to predict the next word, when you like throw enough parameters and like training data and all that stuff at it, you end up with what feels a lot like intelligence and like something right. that's emergent kind of capability. Um, and so for us, it's about predicting the next gameplay experience, the next moment of gameplay, the next level. And um, I would expect similarly, so, so like, you know, we are testing our systems with trying to figure out, hey, can it make a match three game? Can it make a, a level of something that looks right. like Mario Brothers? Yes and yes. So but you have to I think build the first level and then you're like, what's the next? Um, yes, actually that's part of, but not for, um, uh, we have to build a level. So they, I hear you're really fast, like technical under the hood. So like, um, we have what's called a game descriptor, which is a data structure that describes the game in data or describes a game in data and then is, is run through an interpreter that actually produces the game. And then we use right now unity to, to actually render and interact with the, the application. Um, and so in that like framework or schema, um, like we produced the first game descriptor, uh, the first data that describes a game within the simulation. But then, and, and let's say that the first thing that we, we built was like a, you know, something that looked like a 2D platformer, like a Mario or the old Prince of Persia's. But then we said, here's a game descriptor of Mario to the LLM. Now make us a game descriptor for um, a top-down shooting game. And it did and it works. And so like, that's like, it's, it's like in a way, if that, if that answers mm. your question, right? Like, yeah. yes, in a way you need to populate it so that it understands the simulation and the parameters that it has to work with. Right. But it's not like I have to make the first level of all the games. I just make right. a game and it functions and works. And then all mm. the other games can be generated. Amy, I just wanted to ask like a lesson or two from like the crypto gaming experience or like moving, you know, I think on a super surface level take, it's like there was a lot of excitement in crypto and now there's a lot of excitement in AI. Like, will, you know, some of it yeah. overhyped or like, I don't know, what, what are the lessons from having gone through sort of the heat of crypto and now sort of and thinking a lot about sort of AI stuff now? I'll, I'll, I'll kind of keep my answer to the uh, crypto uh, blockchain game side just because, I mean, the broader crypto space, right, yeah. I would say that the... <laughs> The token launches and the abuse of that, um, you know, really kind of dictated a lot of that narrative. But on the gaming side, um, I, to be honest, I, I always thought there was like way too much venture dollars within the blockchain gaming space. There were a lot of um, really bright developers that embarked and wanted to make games for the first time, which is really difficult. I mean, games are really difficult to make, right? Not only do you have to know how to make... Um, a complicated system work um, that balances the game and produces, um, you know, kind of a thousand hours of content for people to have fun with, but also how to live operate that afterwards. I mean, this is, it's just really difficult. And so it took some time before, um, I would say, experienced game devs really actually came into the blockchain industry and was excited as well in terms of finding ways to leverage blockchain technology that that you know could make gameplay feel like something that a player hasn't experienced before i mean if it basically feels the same then i would say anything that adds friction actually is just bad in game design um but it has to be 
it has to be part of like it has to create a gaming a meta that um that is actually totally different and and that and, and is unique and so um i would basically apply and so if you look at all the vc dollars put like that went into the blockchain um games industry a lot of it was not to fund teams with a clear vision of them. Yeah. it was more just like i'm gonna fund it because it's in this category but the devil is absolutely in the detail especially with the rate of failure in the games um content side and so i would apply the same um kind of you know view on uh, with 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 the ai intersection which is one like you know just having the content be ai generated does not mean anyone is going to find this fun uh and so the bar is it needs to be really great content and also um it needs to be uh it, it compared to what, I, what the other things that i could play in the market because you know the most valuable thing is actually person's time you know why would i play some game when I can just play Breath of the Wild or Diablo or, right. you know, CS. The with investors may want to invest because it has sort of a new technique, but at the end of the day, uh, the players don't care that much how it was created and want it to end up being a great game. And the people who can yeah. do that are often the people who have built great games before. Yeah, players don't care about ideology. They care about, um, and I, but I'm game to ask you sometimes, but I mean, players just care about like whether the content is just fun. All right, our last question. What... Looking forward five years, like with the promise of today, like what what is something that you're most excited about? What might be possible in in gaming and AI? When I look back five years ago in gaming, um, what I'm most ex and then I look forward five years. What I'm most excited about is for me personally, and I think many people within the industry, this last five years has been kind of boring, just straight up. Hmm. Like as a, as an industry participant, um, you know, it took five years to make Starfield. Um, and again, I'm going to play it, I'm going to enjoy it, but you know, I, I doubt that I'm going to be blown away by it. And that's really been the story just over and over and over. And the truth is, if I ask myself and I look at the, you know, the, the best games that were launched in the last five years, none of them were, you know, none of them were unlocked or made possible by some specific technology that came out in the last five years. There's a lot of same, same, there's a lot of sequels and like, that's, honestly unfortunate. Um, and it's not just limited to games. It's been all over, I think, entertainment and media. When I look forward to five years, what excites me is that I think that picture will be different. Hmm. Um, and I also think that a lot of the terminology we use to describe gaming is going to get so mushed and blurred and blended that uh, it's just going to look very, very different. I think what what is a consumer or a player? What is a creator? What is a... Um, a uh, streamer or a passive participant. Hmm. I think all of those lines are going to get blurred in really exciting ways as AI enables, um, you know, a, a change in how we interact with technology um, and a democratization to kind of the interaction with technology. Um, and and that unknown is what excites me. Um, that's unknown is what I'm I'm striving for. And and whether I'm right with the company that we're building or not, like I'm I'm here for the change. I, I something new yeah I, I totally agree with that sentiment and yeah the blurring that feels so inevitable uh, that's a exciting vision amy uh, what would what would you offer yeah i would agree um so i think in five years most of the game incumbents will still be the same game incumbents will there be one or two new entrants that has launched something pretty incredible leveraging um you know the new tech um I, I certainly hope so, and I think where I hear where we hear like skepticism and incumbents double um both make us like uh you know kind of proceed cautiously because you know that's the, so much knowledge is baked there, but also all right, this is not where a lot of people are willing to risk you know multi billion dollar titles, so this gives an opportunity for a startup an indie studio to really break out um so yeah i I'm hoping there will be a couple of um of sort of AI native studios that are able to create something super awesome. Awesome. Keith, Amy, thanks so much for coming on the show. This was great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Eric. All right. Fun talking about games. Thanks so much. That's our episode. I'm Eric Newcomer. Uh, Co-hosts are Max Child and James Wilsterman, co-founders of Volley and my longtime friends. Thank you to Scott Brody, our producer, Riley Kinsella, my chief of staff, Gabby Caliendo, a key person at Volley who's helping make this whole conference happen. Uh, shout out to Young Chomsky 
for the theme music. Please like, comment, subscribe on YouTube. Follow us and give us a review on Apple Podcasts. And of course, subscribe to Newcomer, newcomer newcomer.co. Become a paid subscriber. uh, Support everything we do. And then go play volley games uh, on your Alexa. Say, hey, Alexa, let's play song quiz. Anyway, all right. uh, Thanks so much. Uh, See you next week.